Hello, I'm Moni Vargas, the Creative and Program Director at Breakthrough, a nonprofit culture change organization that uses media, arts, and tech to promote human rights. Welcome to Breakthrough Spotlight, our weekly video and podcast series featuring conversations with community leaders, activists, artists, and partner organizations working to build a world that is more equitable, inclusive, and sustainable for all. Thanks for joining us. Today, we invite Deborah Zimmerman. She's the executive director of Women Make Movies, um, which is the largest distributor of films by and about women in the world. And for over 45 years, has supported women filmmakers and their stories. Its production assistance program has helped thousands of women uh, make get their films made. And um, they also curate a virtual film festival, which we're really excited to talk to Deborah about uh, because it is um, just uh, so telling of you know how we all have been all pivoted at this time um, to to really meet the needs of of COVID nineteen, um, and we'll also talk about a lot of uh, resources that um, the organization uh, has compiled um, during this time to help independent filmmakers. So welcome, Deborah. Um, thank you for joining us. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, we're really happy to have you. Um, we, you know, we at Breakthrough have been so impressed with the um, virtual film festival. And uh, when when we saw it, we thought, oh my goodness, we need to have Deborah on to uh, to tell us more about it. Um, but you know, before we even get to that, um, you know, I'd love to hear more about you, about how um, you know you got started with um, Women Make Movies, and you know. There's been so many changes uh, for independent filmmakers, and obviously the last few weeks have seen a whole other host of changes. But before COVID nineteen, what was <laughs> you know? Tell us before COVID, um, tell us you know how um, how you got started, and tell us more about the organization and and really how you support so many women um, around the world. Well, was there anything before COVID? I think that I'm not alone in feeling like this has just been going on forever and probably feels like it will go on forever. Um, but yes, there was, there was life before COVID and Women Make Movies is actually almost 50 years old. Um, and we started out of the heyday of the second wave of the women's movement in the US in the 1970s and have been working to support uh, women's voices and visions in filmmaking, both behind and, and in front of the camera for, yeah, for almost that, that amount of time. Um, as you said before, we have a collection of almost 700 films made by women directors from all over the world. Um, half of the, about half of them are by women from, um, uh, from the global south or women of color in the US or basic or voices of women who are most often misrepresented or not represented in mainstream media. Um, and our production assistance program works with women filmmakers in helping them to try to get their films made um, kind of from concept to completion. Um, and I got involved, um, wow, it's just going back so, it's so long. I've actually been here for, been with the organization for about 40, I don't know, some in the 40s. <laughs> I didn't found the organization, um, but I did come in the late 70s as an intern um, and kind of never left. I mean, I did leave, but not really. Um, and the reason why I got involved and the reason why I continue to be so passionate about what I do is because I really do believe that, um, that women see the world in a very different way than men do. Um, and that we need to see that way that they see the world in order to really understand what women's lives are like. And I'm also a big believer that, that art changes um, hearts and minds um, and really touches people in a very different way. And I have to say that, that it's kind of been borne out in a way by this, this whole COVID experience because I think that what's really brought us all together besides these um, computer screens and Zoom <laughs> is um, a lot of media, people watching a lot of the same things and talking about it and discussing it. 
Um, so it's actually in at the same time that it's been a really difficult and it and it has been difficult, not just you know kind of in our in our isolation and outside of our isolation and within our privilege and the, those who aren't privileged, this has been so, so, so difficult. Um, but there are some um, bright spots. And I would say that, that doing this film festival on, online has been like a little bright spot for us. So. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, um, it's, it has been, you know, it does feel like it's been forever. Um, and, and, uh, and, and I do feel that, um, like you said, you know, culture and arts and films um, really are the catalyst for a lot of, of social change and, um, and, and really change across, you know, many, many industries, many communities. Um, and, you know, that said, um, can you um, tell us um, just a bit more about how, uh, when it comes to, um, you know, the, the distribution, um, you know, model for women movies. How does that, how did that come about? Yeah. And, 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 and what really, what was the impetus behind it? I mean, you know, I, yeah. I'm a filmmaker and uh, it, it is so difficult for women to make movies. Yeah. It is, it is extremely challenging. And we use a lot of the um, Annenberg uh, statistics to, to really push yeah. the fact that we need more women voices in media. Yeah. Yeah. So please, you know, um, school us because you've been doing this for so long. <laughs> like you, you're at the forefront of this, of this movement. So, you know, we'd love to hear more about that. Yeah. So, you know, when Women Make Movies started, it really, the reason why it's called Women Make Movies, excuse me, is actually because we started out teaching women how to make films, um, actually doing a workshop uh, in a church basement in Chelsea, which was a Hispanic neighborhood at the time. Um, and there just wasn't enough women that actually had the skills and knew how to make films. But about 10 years later, the organization went through a, a really big crisis, um, mostly of, of funding because uh, the Republicans got into, got into office and decided that women no longer needed any kind of assistance. Women had accomplished enough. Of course, this was during Reagan, so you can only imagine um, how long ago that was. But um, as a result of that, we went through a really, actually what ended up being a fantastic kind of um, organizational exercise and looked at really what we were doing and, and whether or not the organization should continue and realized that 10 years after we had started, what was most important was a mechanism to get the films out into the world, that women had started being able to make films, but the films that were made weren't being seen. Um, and Women Make Movies actually in our production uh, era had made a film called Health Caring from Our End of the Speculum, which was um, kind of in our bodies ourselves for those who remember from the 70s. Um, it was a film about women's health care, a very important film, which no distributor would distribute because they didn't think that there was a market for a film about women's health care that looked at it from a woman's perspective, which for us now is kind of like ridiculous to think about it, but that was really what was happening. So we distributed it ourselves and it was so successful that other women started coming to us and saying, would you distribute my film? And so it was a combination of the needs of women filmmakers as well as the needs of the organization. Um, and for me, that was around the time that I got back involved with the organization. And I realized that it was a triple win situation, which is a very rare thing in this world where, you know, we all talk about win-win, but this was a win-win-win because women make movies, distributed these films to groups that needed to see these films um, for their educational programs or their cultural programs, either for empowerment or for education. Um, the filmmaker actually made money because we would actually be renting the films and sending uh, royalties back to the filmmaker. And Women Make Movies was able to exist because of it, because of the income that we were making. And that 
for me was just extraordinary. It was like, this works on such a mega level. We can do this. We can be self-sufficient as an organization and not be dependent on the government, which would always, we knew, would always decide that feminism wasn't important, that women weren't important. Years later, we were told that we were a lesbian pornographer because we distributed lesbian films and our funding was cut off again. So in a way, it was very prescient to understand that, that we really needed to have a, a stream of income. Um, and it was fantastic that that stream of income also supported women filmmakers and got their films out into the world. So um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the model. Uh, we work with thousands of groups every year and everything from um, universities and colleges, libraries, prisons, um, forestry services, the military, health organizations, hospitals, social service agencies, girls clubs, um, high schools, just really anybody that uses film in any kind of way for their community-based work, for again, higher or even K through 12 education, um, and with some of the biggest museums um, and film festivals in the world, um, which is kind of on the other side of things, um, supporting filmmakers in a different way because those kinds of screenings really help them in terms of their careers, um, help to give them a profile in the industry, which we also realize is really important. Um, the production assistance program actually came about because of a filmmaker named Julie Dash, um, who made a really important film called Daughters of the Dust, which was the first film by an African-American woman to be uh, theatrically released in the US. And she came to us and we were distributing a short film that she made called Illusions. And she came to us and asked us uh, if we could help her to raise the money for Daughters of the Dust because she was having so much trouble. And so we did, we did a fundraiser for her. And we kind of put that together with the fact that we were doing what's called fiscal sponsorship, which is you know, an important way that US filmmakers uh, are able to get their films funded because they need a nonprofit 501c3 organization in order to go to foundations and corporations and government for funding or to get tax deductible donations from individuals. So we kind of put those two things together and created this production assistance program. Um, and we're really, we're really proud of, of everything that we do, but we're especially proud because of the films that we've been able to support um, from, you know, from production to completion. Um, films like Citizen Four by Laura Poitras or um, Yancey Ford's film Strong Island, which was the first film by a trans filmmaker to be nominated for an Academy Award. Um, and, uh, oh, just, a uh, you know, fiction yeah. films like, um, A Diary of a Teenage Girl or Shirkers. Um, of course, the filmmaker of Diary of a Teenage Girl ended up making, um, the, her latest film is, um, uh, Won't You Be My Neighbor with Tom Hanks. And we were working with her at the very beginning of her career. And that's something that, that we think also is really, really important that we're supporting both emerging filmmakers as well as established filmmakers. I love that. So Daughters of the Dust is, uh, yeah, it is such an epic, gorgeous film. And it's shocking that it couldn't get, you know, distribution. Well, no, it was, it's not shocking, actually, at, at it all. Get funding. It wasn't distribution. It couldn't get funding. And, but I just want to say, kind of going to that, the, your comment about the Annenberg statistics, you know, she's still having trouble getting, raising money for her films. We're sponsoring her latest production, which is called Travels of a Geechee Girl. And it's also going back to the same part of the country where Daughters of the Dust was uh, set. And uh, she and her producer have raised, they got a major grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, but they haven't matched it yet. So they're still, she's still having trouble. And that's 20 years later, maybe yes, more. Dash. <laughs> And it's Julie Dash, yeah. exactly. Preeminent yeah. uh, African American woman filmmaker. Yeah. Yes. yes. Um, so, uh, and on that, yeah, with Yancy, um, I uh, worked with Yancy in when I, in my first production job. Oh, you're kidding! Yeah, oh, wow. Twenty amazing. Ago. Um, and I'm so happy to see the film, um, you know, come together. And in, in, it's so powerful. The film is so, so powerful. And I'm just happy that it got the recognition that it deserves. Um, also, another film of yours, Ovarian Psychos. And I, <laughs> yeah. 
that um which actually is showing in the virtual film festival this week <laughs> So, so let's go into the, because I don't know how time, it's already 10, 20. I mean, uh, yeah, 20. I have no idea how oh, it's going to okay. But I want to talk to you about the Virtual Film Festival because it is so powerful. And, you know, we were just saying before we got on that right now, I think we're all yearning for, you know, just different perspectives on, uh, on, on in media and, and film. And, you know, I've always longed for that, but I think now more than ever. Um, so tell us about um, the Virtual Film Festival, um, how it started. I know that it was uh, for Women's History Month. Yeah. And- <laughs> Tell us about that. It really, I have to say, you know, um, I just want to go back for one second, but I do feel like we have always been able to be a little bit ahead of the curve because our filmmakers are a little bit ahead of the curve. Um, we were a quote unquote multicultural organization before they ever used the word multicultural. And after 9-11, we had an amazing collection of films uh, by and about Arab and Muslim women, and were able to offer that for free um, as an educational project because there was so much racism against uh, Arab and Muslim women at the time. Um, Not just women, but in particular, there were women that were really being harassed in Brooklyn, and that's kind of how that started. So it started locally, but went actually internationally. And it was, in the very beginning of the internet, actually. And this little project that we had went viral and went global. And the same thing kind of happened this time. It, we were just doing this. <laughs> we had decided to do this Women's Film Festival online for Women's History Month. And we really expected it to be this little small thing. Um, and then COVID happened and the world exploded, everything exploded and the festival exploded. Um, and it's now more than 5,000 people in more than 90 countries around the world, places I've never even heard of. Um, and I've been, I travel a lot, but we've got South Pacific nations like uh, Wallace and Fortuna that I'd never heard of. It's in Kyrgyzstan and uh, Saudi Arabia and Albania and Iran, places that I am just amazed that they're actually able to access our films. And they never have been before, I think. So that's really, um, that's, that's incredible and fantastic. So anyway, we started with this idea of a, um, of a transnational feminist film festival. And there were films by women from all over the world. And then it took off and we said, okay, let's just keep on going with it. So now we've got, um, a series called um, uh, Films Interrupted. And those are films that were supposed to screen in film festivals uh, throughout the, the US mostly in March. And they weren't able to screen because all the theaters were shut down. Um, and that's going on for the next week or so. We are doing Q and A's with filmmakers. So this Friday, um, one of the films that's screening is, there's two films on, on Native American issues. One is called Conscience Point. And it's a really amazing story about how um, the Native community in Long Island, which is within this unbelievably rich enclave of the Hamptons, was able to really fight successfully for their land rights. Um, and the filmmaker is going to be uh, doing a Q&A on Friday at noon. And then next week, we've got a fantastic film called uh, Waging Change, which is about very relevant because it's about restaurant workers and other tipped workers that are basically making a really insane $2.12 an hour in many states in the US. And there's a wonderful organization called One Fair Wage that's fighting on their behalf. And of course, right now we're seeing this unbelievable uh, difference in the way that, that people are getting paid, not getting paid, able to work, not able to work, having to work uh, given, given the COVID crisis. Um, and then after those films, we're gonna pivot into a series that we hope is gonna give people hope and inspiration. And it's called uh, Extraordinary, Ordinary Women, Extraordinary Lives. And we're gonna go international again and look at women activists from all over the world doing incredible things from Nigeria to India to um, the Middle East and Latin America, as well as throughout the US. So um, yeah, we'd love to have people join us. It's all free, wmm.com.
so Deborah, um, I do know that, that you also have compiled a great list of um, resources mm -hmm. um, for independent filmmakers on your site, uh, especially uh, in light of, of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and I would, you know, um, love to just hear a bit about um, how it's affecting, obviously, you know, you have been able to pivot um, very gracefully and quickly uh, with, with the virtual film festivals, but, um, you know, uh, what, um, for independent filmmakers, what are you seeing um, as, um, as, you know, different needs and, and, and resources, um, and what are you hearing from, from your community? Yeah, so, um, you know, filmmakers have been affected in a really major way because there's no production. And so many filmmakers make a living by uh, working on other people's productions and um, they're not able to shoot their own films. So it's, it's really been a crisis situation. So we, as you said, really, luckily we have a fantastic staff and they were able to put together this great list of resources. There are lots of resources out there for filmmakers, everything from small grants to uh, webinars, free webinars, free, um, educational content. We're doing all of our normal webinars. They'll, they'll be free. Um, and we're actually putting up on our website all of last year's webinars. And those are webinars on everything from fundraising to budgeting to meet the industry events so that you can hear from the Ford Foundation or POV on PBS or the Cinema du Real, uh, Neon the Neon Vision du Real Film Festival in Switzerland. So again, it's just a very broad uh, range of events and information that filmmakers can get about um, how they can access other resources. Um, we also did a, a meeting with our, an online meeting with our filmmakers and asked them to uh, give us kind of what they need. So the top thing that everybody wanted was a webinar on uh, creating a pitch deck for their films, which of course is an, an important little function, and especially now because you need to be able to send something to people. Um, so we'll be doing that in the next, uh, next couple of weeks, as well as uh, a webinar panel on what filmmakers can do in terms of uh, getting their films out virtually with film festivals. So those are two, two of the ideas. But again, if you go to our website, which is wmm.com, um, and one of the banners has a link to resources for artists um, and filmmakers during the crisis. Yeah, I mean, just hearing what you have planned um, just makes my heart burst. It's just, <laughs> you know, as, as a filmmaker, sometimes you work independently in a bubble and it, you're just in your head and you're doing your work. Um, but then, you know, to come into contact with such a, a rich community, um, it is really wonderful. Um, people are already signing up, which yeah, is that's great. Um, you know, and I do want to open it up, up to, okay, so we're at 1029. Deborah, I don't want to take up too I'm much. I'm fine. Time. I'm good. You're okay. Yeah. So maybe we open it up now um, to some questions from the audience. Does anyone have any questions? Um, or if there's anything, Deborah, that we haven't touched upon that you, you know, that mm -hmm. you feel we need to um, discuss, um, you know, for, for breakthrough, it's, it's really important. And, and please just, um, you can either wave or just send us a chat with your question. Um, but, um, but basically, you know, I, I, you know, at Breakthrough, you know, we are in, you know, using culture to change culture and, and using, you know, film and media and tech um, to, to drive um, a, a human rights vision where, you know, we are all living with dignity um, in, in justice and in, in, in respect. And, you know, I would love um, to hear um, if there's, if there's no questions, um, you know, maybe now um, what, there are so many films that have had, you know, a great um, deal of influence, you know, in our society. Um, if you can think of any right now that you think, you know, even during the film festival that people should really watch, um, does anything come to mind right now? Well, there's actually one that isn't in the festival anymore, unfortunately. Maybe we might be able to bring it back for a reprise, um, but it's called Hashtag Female Pleasure. And it's a film about five women from all over the world, including Deborah Feldman, who was profiled in Unorthodox, which a lot of people are watching on Netflix. Um, but it's women from 
you know, five different countries, all who are really trying to reclaim their sexuality in light of um, the intense patriarchy um, around the world. And it's a great one. That one will be, I think it'll be on Canopy. Very, it's on Canopy. Actually, it is on Canopy. So if you have access to public library um, or if you're a student or, or a faculty member in a university and you have a log on and your, your, um, your school has a subscription to Canopy, you can watch that one for free. Um, Let's see. I also love uh, Ovarian Psychos, which is on right now. Um, also, there's another film called Yours and Sisterhood, uh, which is a film about Ms. Magazine and the, um, the letters to the editor to Ms. Magazine in the 70s. And this filmmaker went around the country having people read the letters and trying to find the women that wrote the letters back then. So it's, a, it's been a really popular, great film. And um, let's see what else. Um, I think next week, uh, well, besides Waging Change, there's going to be a film called Councilwoman, which is about an amazing um, woman in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, who's from the Dominican Republic, who's a, works in a, a hotel as a housemaid, and she decides to run for city council. Um, and she gets into city council and it's, it's just a great story about the power, I think, of women's leadership. I don't know if anybody saw the, um, I've just been kind of thinking a lot about this article that was in Forbes, uh, a couple of days ago on it. And what it said was that it asked, what do these countries have in common? The countries that are actually doing the best job of fighting, um, COVID and they're all countries that have women's women leaders. Mm -hmm. really important um so i'm kind of excited that we'll be doing this uh this series about women's leadership and activism yes and mark i think you had i, mean, I couldn't agree with you more um but mark i think you had a question or a comment so hi so i i just had a quick comment and i just really appreciate um the the weekly digest of the upcoming films and i hope you just keep that up um, uh, so, I mean, that way, you know, you could have sort of schedule your week and I, you know, and I love that. I just love that, um, that you have that. I may have missed this when I had to step away for a little bit and I know that you have different themes that you're going to be going out, but how long do you think that you'll be, um, doing the festival now that we've been extended? <laughs> yeah, I don't again. think we're ever going to stop, Mark. <laughs> That's fabulous. <laughs> We're so, listen, you know, I was telling this to Moni before, we are so, it's so exciting to get this direct contact from people. Um, yesterday, we got an email from a woman who said that, um, oh, and well, actually, let me just say that if you're a participant in the festival, you can also participate in a group discussion that's connected to the festival, and people sign up, and it just, it's a Facebook group, that's all. Um, you just ask to be... Uh, a member and we say yes and um people get a chance to talk about the films and, and meet some of the filmmakers um so this woman just posted that she's been watching the films with her two daughters and that she's so grateful because it's really uh, they've had such great discussions around the films and somebody else contacted us and said we want to give you money <laughs> and we want to give some of your filmmakers money so that was really great too so um in some way, shape, or form, I think this is going to really change the way that we um, release films. I think we're going to be having little festivals going on and doing screenings um, to introduce the new films that we have. And we've got some really great films coming up, actually. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing how we can use the festival as a model for doing that. That's so, amazing. So this, you know, so... I love hearing stories of how this crisis is an, also an opportunity and how we are, you know, that we're so nimble and that us as a society, we find a way. Absolutely. So I mean, I, I will say that it's, I, I want to just call, shout out my staff who've done just an amazing, amazing job. This whole festival has been the brainchild of a very new staff person that we have, Kendra Hodgson. Um, she's our director of strategy and innovation, and she's been very strategic and very innovative. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's wonderful. And that everybody else was really able to just kind of, yeah, that, that word pivot and, 
you know, change the way that we're doing things. I'm also very proud that we were able to be really responsive to our university um, partners because they all needed to try to figure out how to do distance learning and remote education. So what we've done is that we've set up free streams for them of films that they have DVDs of that they don't have digitally. Um, and we've also offered big discounts on digital site licensing to help them to be able to continue their work. Um, and, you know, I, I also just want to say that I think it has that, that kind of bright spot of the way that people are working together, you know, even us doing this, you know, we've known each other, women make movies and breakthrough have known each other for so long, but we've never really done anything together. And here we are. So, um, yeah, it's, it's yeah. great. It is. And, you know, um, and I think, you know, we're all looking for these stories of hope and optimism and creativity and collaboration um, because everything else around us is changed so drastically um, that I think, you know, having uh, moments like this where we can come together and, and, you know, first of all, learn so much, but second of all, like have um, access to so much creativity and, and wonderful stories from around the world. Um, Deborah, you know, we can't thank you enough for making time. I know you're super busy and, um, you know, we, um, I appreciate everyone who, who dialed in. This was very last minute. So for all the upcoming ones, um, you know, we will have enough time to really get the word out. So please, you know, continue to sign up for these um, on our, on our website. Uh, on and we hope yes. Debbie comes back. Yes, the last another one. And also, we will let our constituents know about the about your next events. So keep on, you know, let us know, and let's Thank continue working together. Thank you, and Deborah, and and you know, I think. Uh, just to say one last thing is, you know, thank you for being so generous. I mean, I, I do feel that right now, um, again, this generosity goes a long way. So, you know, we appreciate um, your just generosity of time and, and obviously with all the great films that you're, you know, you're, you're putting out in the world. Um, but thanks again. Um, we're gonna, close, we're gonna close out. My name is Moni Vargas. And uh, I, I think we're so excited. We couldn't be more excited to, to um, really dive in and, and, and feed our souls um, for the, you know, with, with all these movies and films. Um, and again, Deborah, thank you so much. Thank Hopefully you. And thank you for you from Breakthrough's work, which is amazing.